and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, the podcast conversation with a change maker working to accelerate the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society. I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. The flower industry has a heavy environmental footprint, but some growers are changing their agricultural and shipping practices. We're joined today by Tuan Overgag, president of family owned Westerlay Orchids, which he took over from his father in 2009. A grower and seller of live orchids based in Carpentaria, California, Westerlay has grown rapidly, adding relationships with Trader Joe's, Kroger, and Safeway after transitioning to orchid production from rose production in the uh, 2010s. Tuan also introduced sustainable agriculture practices using natural predators instead of pesticide to deal with uh, insects, energy and water management technologies, and reusing waste exhaust CO2 to increase the photosynthesis of its plants. Westerlay distributes more than 3 million orchids directly to customers from its website and through local and national supermarket chains. We want to discuss the environmental implications of the flower growing industry and how to improve them. Westerlay uses slow shipping, ensuring trucks are full before moving flowers uh, to minimize the impact of sending flowers from stores and to customers. The company produces about 2.7 ounces of CO2 emissions per unit sold and reported 331 tons of emissions from ocean and freight shipping in 2021. That's about the equivalent of the emissions of 23 average Americans based on 2020 figures. Tuan, whose family is Dutch, joined the MPS, a certification program for the Netherlands flower industry, which has awarded Westerlay an A rating each year. You can learn more about Westerlay orchids at www.westerlay.com. Westerlay is spelled W-E-S-T-E-R-L-A-Y, westerlay.com. Welcome to the show, Tuan. How are you doing today? Doing pretty good. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, I, first I want to start off and, and ask about the difference between live flowers and cut flowers. Cut flowers have a, a very different economics because once they're cut, they lose their value very quickly. What is the what are the differences between the two industries and their environmental impact? I'll try to answer it the best I can. Um, you know, we don't really say uh, live flowers; we say live plants or pot plants. plants. Okay. So, yeah, we grow potted orchids so we grow a live plant a potted plant and uh you know a lot of that has to do with your when you're shipping a potted plant you're shipping something that's still alive that is going to have space around it you really can't put too many together uh there are restrictions about uh importing plants that are grown in a substrate for uh, environmental reasons for uh, pest reasons into the united states so Live plants, potted plants, are grown almost exclusively in North America. There's some, there's there's exceptions with Canada. Um, so they're exclusively grown in North America, um, as opposed to cut flowers, which are largely for labor reasons, grown mm -hmm. abroad. Uh, so you can take a box of roses or a box of chrysanthemums and put a lot of dollar value in a box of that stuff. Uh, coming from Colombia was the most common country, actually, that cut flowers come from, and flying that into the United States. Uh, and because, as you uh, noted yourself, once you cut a flower, the clock is ticking as to how long that lasts for the consumer. So those are generally having to be flown in. Uh, there are some exceptions, and, and guys are looking at ways they can move product like that with container ship. Mm -hmm. But once a cut, once a flower is cut. Um, it's expiring and needs to get to market as soon as possible. So that typically means air freight. So, you know, I was really interested to see that you switched from roses mm -hmm. um, after you took over and, and your revenue exploded. You're up 400% over the past 12, 14 years. Sure. What was key to that? Was moving to orchids a deliberate and particularly environmentally motivated decision? I have, I must be honest, you know, this is something that was 20 years ago and maybe it wasn't as top of mind then. Um, it was really driven by the simple economics of it. As I mentioned, uh, you know, countries, Colombia, Ecuador, also countries in Africa, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, cut flowers are grown and flown in the United States. And it's really hard to compete against the, the cost of labor. It's the same thing that, you know, people don't make a lot of shoes in the United States anymore. Those come from abroad as well. 
And that's really, it's, it's an industry that uh, involves relative to the end value, it involves a lot of labor. So countries with low labor costs have a huge advantage there. So that really drove us to look and see what we could be good at. And frankly, we land, there's a lot of different potted plants. We landed on orchids in the early 2000s. And, you know, part of that is that we have to give ourselves a little bit of credit, but a lot of that was also luck. That was a moment mm -hmm. in time in when the technology in growing orchids was changing a lot. And uh, you were able to grow and supply orchids in, in big numbers at a much lower cost than historically. So uh, the market for orchids over that decade really exploded in terms of the, what, what the market was and what you could sell because the price came down so much. Uh, having said all that, and we're, you know, in, for your <clears throat> uh, purposes of, of this podcast, really, uh, while it wasn't the main driver, mm -hmm. there were a couple definite environmental benefits. Uh, roses in particular, but most cut flowers are growing very quickly. It's, it, it, they tend to be uh, a soft uh, vegetation, a uh, lot of uh, flowers that are open or mm -hmm. attractive to pollinators and other and, and, and pests and things. So your, I shouldn't say pollinators, but pests, thrips, uh, spider mite, that sort of stuff. So you're looking at a lot of uh, uh, pests that are damaging the crop, that are taking away the commercial value of the crop. So you're having to address that in some way. And that typically means pesticides. So most cut flowers require a good amount of pesticides and roses, probably are among the highest. And so orchids, interestingly, because orchids are a tropical plant uh, grown at warmer temperatures typically than what's environmentally outside where we live here, even in Southern California. Um, and it has a very hard uh, cuticle of really tough vegetation. Orchids mm -hmm. have very little pest problems. So we, our, our, our use of pesticides is dropped off like by a factor of 20. So we still need some here and there. There's a spot where you have a flare up. Uh, we generally tend to work with, uh, with beneficials. And then that's something else in the last 20 years that the host of beneficial insects in that industry has gotten a lot bigger and they've gotten a lot more effective. Uh, but the use of pesticides in orchids compared to in cut flowers is, like I said, it's like a factor of 20. Well, now you you follow the Floriculture Sustainability Initiative's uh, natural pest management uh, approach, so you're sure. using these beneficial insects. Is that something that can be extended all the way to the home use of it? I mean, are those insects traveling with the orchids and and caring for them as they are uh, by the owner? You know, the the the, the insects, the uh, the beneficials need a population to mm -hmm. to feed off of. Um, so you know, you can't have a savannah with apex predators like lions etc without a bunch of gazelles right um to make a bit of an analogy and so if, if the crop is kept clean we're constantly feeding beneficials in okay. um so the, the product is showing up clean so there really shouldn't be that many beneficials there either um there are i think there are uh, beneficial products for the home uh, not a lot, unfortunately. Maybe that'll start picking up, but uh, the products are showing up clean, and that's the number one thing, of course. Now, the other the other element of what the FSI requires is that you track that kind of chemical uses, usage very carefully. And, mm -hmm. and this also extends to another question that we talk with a lot of companies about, which is how do you disclose that kind of information, what's been used in terms of pesticides on the plant, and overall the environmental impact? Because I want to talk about the the difference between the way you grow and the traditional approach as well. Okay, um, you know, I, I would want to say from the outset that when you say the traditional way, I don't want your listeners to sort of have a perception that uh, industry-wide there's a lot of nasty practices. I think the level of what people are doing industry-wide goes up and up and up every year. The industry okay. is getting better. We like to think that we're trying to move a little faster there than regulatory. We are moving faster than regula regulations require. We want to be uh, conscientious. We want to do our best. We're not just settling for the bare minimum, but the whole industry is getting better. It's it's a, it's a total difference. I'm, I've been in this for 30 years. It, it's, it's a huge difference from where we were 30 years ago. 
Well, how has it changed? What are people talking about today that they weren't talking about 20 or, 20 or 30 years ago? Uh, I think not just talking, but doing. I mean, the idea that you would look at, hey, how you know, big picture, how can we produce in a completely sustainable way? How can we produce with an absolute minimum carbon footprint? Those people would have not understood that you were even talking about 30 years ago. Right. Um, you know, pesticides were sort of seen as like, hey, there's a bunch of nails out there. This is our hammer. This is how we deal with this. Uh, and not sort of recognizing the uh, the costs. Mm -hmm. Those things cost a lot of money. Um, they really retard the growth of plants. Pesticides aren't good for plants. You know, the, 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 the fewer pesticides you use, the, the better your plants grow. They're not good for plants. Um, but, uh, it, of course, it's driven by a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Well, I think overall, uh, internally speaking, for growers like myself, the economics are sort of unavoidable. Like if pesticides cost a lot of money, um, energy costs a lot of money, you want to use as little as possible that you can. That's that's simple economics. It's also driven by regulatory, especially we're in, this, in, in California here that is really... Um, I think compared to the, uh, the rest of the country, it generally tends to be pretty forward thinking about that. Sometimes we, as growers, we complain and sometimes, you know, the, uh, the, the regulations may sometimes miss the force for the trees, but generally speaking in the broad sense, it's going in the right direction, pushing people. So that's kind of on the bottom end, pushing things up. Um, and then on the top end that there's consumers. What do consumers care about? I can tell you, um, that when we started, for example, working with MPS, that is, uh, MPS is the Milieu Project for Seer Tales. Uh, that's a Dutch um, phrase that means the uh, Environmental Project for Horticulture. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an NGO out of the Netherlands that we cooperate with, that we benchmark our practices against uh, others in our industry worldwide. Um, it's generally really heavy in Europe, but we were one of the first in the United States, but now there's, I think, a few dozen. Uh, growers in North America who who subscribe to this benchmarking system. But when we first started with that, nobody cared. Uh, and there were some sort of early efforts for benchmarking. But frankly, I remember looking at a couple of them and rejecting them out of hand. I remember a, 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 a firm came by here to do an evaluation of us to see, you know, where could you, uh, could we get their certification, their, their green label, as it were. Mm -hmm. And... The guy walked around for 45 minutes and goes, oh, you're almost there. This is really good. And I was like, I'm not using you. If you think I'm already really good, then you're not pushing me. I want to go with a really high standard, one that's going to come and audit me and make me be better. And anyone who's like, no, you're already there is just selling something and isn't really going to push me. So, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm digressing, but I think there's, there's the environment for growers is, is changing. There's internally, there's the cost for growers uh, of the sort of pushing us from the bottom is the regulatory and then pulling us from top is uh, is the awareness of consumers and, and consumer concerns. Uh, and I think I was just starting to say, and I didn't really finish the thought that 10 years ago, consumers, I think it was out there as just stating, but it's now much more fully formed and consumers are looking for labels and looking to understand um, I don't think it's where it ought to be yet. I don't think there's a sort of universal uh, uh, understanding. There's, you know, like food labeling or anything like that. Uh, that's, I think that's going to be coming at some point, but it's still being formed. Well, what, what should that label communicate? Because uh, you are, you're using, you grow in greenhouses. So obviously yes. you have closed systems. You're not probably releasing a lot of nitrogen into the, uh, into the environment uh, that to pollute groundwater and so forth. Yeah. What would you recommend a consumer look for in a live plant? Uh, in terms of its I, I, think a, I think a good label has to be like the the NPS label for which we're rated A, right? Mm -hmm. That is, uh, and we have been for eight years. That's sort of that's a benchmark compared to industry wide. Uh, however, that's still kind of graded on curve, as it were. So I'm not sure. It, it isn't really about absolutes. I think a better label has some sort of simplified rating for your environmental impact, but it's an absolute. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the environmental impact of this product? Here's an absolute. Um, 
you know, you can't, uh, uh, there's always, it, 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 it's tough. I think if you break it down too much, obviously you're an incredibly knowledgeable person. Your listeners are probably uh, much more knowledgeable than the average consumer, but we're, we have to address the average consumer. So if we talk about things like uh, uh, nitrogen release, we talk about carbon footprint, uh, those are relatively simple. Um, then, you know, I, and I think a standardized format is also helpful because we as growers also want to market. We want to have a good uh, economic result. And that's going to motivate some people to, uh, to try to sell certain aspects of, of what they're doing sure. that, they're, that they're well. Uh, so what, that, may, it, that, so, may, that may miss the big picture. Right. But so, and our, our listeners are very interested in being better at it. I don't think any of us know this very well yet because it's an emerging science, as you've talked about. So, for instance, your site says that your growing one orchid uses about as much fertilizer as a six by six square foot patch of grass mm -hmm. and 12 and a half gallons of water, which is about as much as a five minute shower. How does that compare to where growing a plant was 20 years ago? What kind of progress have we seen? I also have to confess that's one of a, a project that's on our marketing team's plate is to update, update our website because those numbers have come down because we're okay. doing, we've got a better closed loop um, in terms of our, our recycling. So the amount of water and the amount of fertilizer is, is down. Um, so we're able to do better with that. Uh, unfortunately, um, so we are a small company. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily always on top of our, our of our website and stuff like that. There is, that is a Q4 project for 22 is to update our website. Uh, I can't give you the exact numbers. I can't give you what it used to be. Um, I think there was certainly water in California going back decades and decades has always been like, we're very conscious of how much we're using. We're certainly not sure. using any extra water when we can help it. Um, I can't give you a good answer, I'm afraid. Like okay. where we, we, we haven't, we didn't track. We're, and even now we're so you're like moving said, through we've, we've improved that I can't I can't break down a number for you. I know that once we started creating a closed loop system, you know, you're saving 35% of your water. Okay. So you're moving from really not tracking to tracking and yeah, I think that's the first step. progress yeah. on a, and you see that happening across the industry. Um uh, yeah, and I I think that's that's happening across the industry. Companies are another thing you see is companies, you know. This might not be appealing to everybody to hear, but it's a true, it's a true thing. I, in, in my experience, is that companies are there are fewer companies, but they're bigger companies, mm -hmm. and those companies are becoming a little more professional, um, so less mom and pop, and so with regulatory requirements as well, companies getting bigger, there are more resources and more requirements available to start measuring things. And if you want to participate with something like MPS you have to start measuring everything that you're doing as well. So that's that's the way uh, the entire world is is moving. And certainly our industry is no exception. In fact, if, I, if anything, I think um, ag generally and horticulture in particular, we're probably a little bit behind the rest of the world and, and we're catching up. Well, it's good to hear this progress, that's, that's certainly. So uh, we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna be right back. We're back to continue talking with Tuan Overgag. He is the president of the Westerlay Orchids uh, live flower business and uh, want to continue talking about the improvements in the industry. So let me ask you this. Uh, you use a technology called Vitatherm, which recirculates CO2 that's produced in part of your uh, of your grow process. How does that work? And, and how much does that reduce the CO2 emissions from your farm? Okay, well, so... Natural gas, which is the principal thing that we use to heat our greenhouses, mm -hmm. uh, when burned cleanly, produces nearly pure CO2. If you're not burning it cleanly, there's carbon monoxide in there. There's uh, uh, right. some other gases that are less friendly in there for plants. But CO2, uh, we'll go back to our high school biology, is exactly what plants need to respire, what plants need to produce uh, sugars and grow. Um, so yes, we think of CO2, of course, as, as the major uh, culprit in uh, global warming, global climate change, and, and it is, uh, but it also is what makes plants, it's vital for plant growth. Um, 
Well, we too much of it in the atmosphere generally, it's uh, yeah. the wall, but within a, a closed setting like a greenhouse, it can be in, very- In a greenhouse in our closed setting, what we're able to do is we take, the, the, the boilers are extraordinarily efficient. So we're burning the natural, and the vitotherm is the burner, which is, you can think of it as the brain that's on a, a, a boiler is a big dumb machine and a burner is the brain that runs it. Mm -hmm. So the brain, the boil uh, is is uh, by company. There's different companies, but we use a company called Vitotherm. Vitotherm is the brain that runs it, and what it does is it, it regulates the temperature most efficient to run the boiler, mixing the right amount of uh, uh, oxygen and and gas to burn most cleanly. Then it takes that waste exhaust. Obviously, it heats water directly. That's what we're using to heat our greenhouses, and then it takes the waste gas, which is pure CO2. Cools that down because it comes out very hot, as you may imagine. It cools it down, but then does a secondary warming. So you're talking about for the for every calorie of gas that we burn, we're getting like 96, 97 percent efficiency. It's capturing an en enormous amount of energy. These boilers are extremely efficient. So for what we're burning, we're getting think of it as a car that has an extraordinary it's still a gas burning car mm -hmm. but you're talking about a bar, car that gets 40 miles to the gallon as opposed to something that gets 18 miles to the gallon it's extraordinarily efficient now the other and thing then we took, i'm sorry i wanted to finish that so then we do cool that gas down one more time uh the exhaust to get a little even secondary heating benefit from that and then what you've got down is this cooled down massive co2 in the atmosphere and then we're using a series of tubes to push that into the greenhouse. Naturally occurring CO2 levels are around 400 parts per million. And we're pushing that in the greenhouse and we'll raise it to about 800 parts per million. Anything beyond that doesn't really help. But so we're raising the CO2 into the greenhouses to 800 parts per million because the greenhouse is closed, certainly most of the time for an orchid. Uh, the plants got an enriched atmosphere and studies show that's been done in a, in a very controlled environment. We can't do that, but in controlled right. laboratory environments, it shows you're getting a 10% extra growth. So you're creating 10% more uh, CO2 is locked up in that rich environment and plant is, is converted into plant growth than would otherwise be. Uh, the very the fact of the matter that that extra 400 ppm that we you know we're doubling, we're enriching the environment. Is all of that absorbed in the plant? No, absolutely not. Not even half of it less than that most of it is still escaping in the atmosphere but we are but we are able to directly lock part of it into the so plant. you're fixing some of it that, that we're that's fixing it. some of it I, I i can't say how much it's it's less than half it's probably quite a bit less than half but we are recapturing directly and feeding it into plant growth part of it now, i'd love to do that. i'd love to have it technology is changing technology is getting better you know they're talking about carbon fixing directly at the source Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I don't think that technology exists in an economical way, uh, as far as I know. But you know, hopefully, that will, you know, things move fast. Hopefully, that that's somewhere in our, in a, in the next generation or so. Now, you have, you come from a Dutch background, and you mentioned MPS. What have you learned from the Dutch flower industry, which is really probably the most advanced in the world in terms of its technical sophistication? Uh, what did we learn from MPS? Um, you know, I, I, have I learned anything specific? No, but I think MPS is a great uh, tool in that it is really a sort of soup, soup to nuts of best practices. Mm -hmm. And the, the administration of it, the process of it is so rigorous. Uh, they audit us. In fact, we just got audited uh, earlier this week. We just had our annual audit. And that is something that, for us, if we weren't getting audited annually, I wouldn't even be interested in this product because it keeps us honest. Like it comes in and every year they're adding stuff. Is there any, so that, that's the best answer I can give. There isn't anything specific we've learned like, oh, this is a, a better practice. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all things we know, but it, it's keeping, it's creating a baseline for us and it's comparing us and, and we're learning, I guess we are learning, hey, what are we doing compared to others? One thing actually that is interesting that we learned is because we are uh, where we are physically located in Southern California with a really, really mild climate, our actual environmental impact, 
our carbon footprint mm -hmm. is substantially lower than a lot of other growers that are located in less ideal conditions, colder areas, or even hotter areas where they're running a lot of energy to cool the greenhouses. We're in such a mild area that um, it doesn't take a lot to create an idealized climate for us. And that makes a big environmental difference. Have you set scope one and scope two emissions goals for the company? Are you working to baseline where you are today and how to improve that overall? We started, um, we, we just completed our third, they we're in our fourth year, I think, third mm -hmm. or fourth year, I'm sorry, uh, of measuring our carbon footprint. Uh, the first year, I think we're in our fourth year, but the first year was kind of just figuring out a lot of stuff and we made a lot of error mistakes. Uh, but we, we measure our carbon footprint and we do set goals um, for reduction. It's more of a moving target. We've got sort of like, hey, our annual, this is what we're trying to do. And we've got our long-term vision. Uh, what is your, your long-term goal? Our long-term goal is to have a facility that has no scope one emissions to be carbon neutral. The techno I can tell you today that technology does not exist. Mm -hmm. We have plans drawn up for a new facility. We, we're, we're actually actively looking to build a new facility. Uh, and that facility, for example, would reduce uh, our electrical consumption would go up, uh, but our natural gas consumption would fall by two thirds. Mm -hmm. And that's based on technology called uh, a heating pump, which is basically what runs your refrigerator at home, but on a huge industrial scale where you're able to, uh, <clears throat> through compression, of refrigerant, you're able to both create heat and cold, and you're storing your heat uh, during the day and using cold to keep greenhouses at a nice temperature. And then you reverse the process at night, and you've taken that heat that you've stored in water, and you're using that to heat your greenhouses, and you're creating cold, and you're storing that. Mm -hmm. And that's all with electric, um, and that you can do that. So you're able to then heat your greenhouses and cool your greenhouses using a very efficient technology. And that's all with electric. And of course, electric largely can be done with renewables. Uh, we're not, you know, there's there's still not enough renewables out there, but um, we're, we're certainly moving in the right direction. So either renewables that you're creating yourself on site with your own solar, your own wind, or that you're buying off the grid. Um, that, that's, that's the vision there that can do a lot. Uh, it isn't all the way there yet, but, uh, you know, that's that's the vision. That's the long term. That's the big goal. Uh, in the short term, you know, we look at, hey, what did we do last year for, for carbon footprint? What can we do to improve? Um, we have uh, this last year. So exactly a year ago, we went online in September of 21 with uh, 560 uh, panel project here on solar that's right above my roof here. So at one of our facilities, we are, we'll see where we land, but we're about 90, 95% of our electrical needs at this facility we're generating ourselves. Um, we'd like to do that at our other main facility, but there are regulatory issues there about where you can place panels and such. So that's local regulatory issues. Is, is that a local problem or is that a California problem? Yeah, it's a, it's more of a local issue. It's more of a local issue. There's a building. Can the can the building handle the load? Is the building you know okay. like you know a building was built 20, 30 years ago by a certain code. The code has changed, mm -hmm. and now you can, you don't have to do anything to the building. The building's fine. But if you want to update the building, you've you've got to. And so that's not always possible. So then, where do you put the panels? That sort of thing. So there there are there are. Again, sometimes the regulations aren't always uh, as they're, they're trying to create regulations that are overall best, but there are particular instances like I feel for us, for example, like we know that if you got an engineer out and they sketch it out, they said, absolutely, this building can handle the load, but regula regulations say no. So now you mentioned scope one emissions, scope two and scope three, particularly scope three are just notoriously hard to measure. Yeah. Is the industry working on anything to try to share data so that your suppliers can inform you about their up and downstream emissions and you can account for your full scope three? Okay, so let me do my best to address first scope two. Mm -hmm. 
and then also confess a little bit of my own ignorance. You know, I, I, I want to learn too, so I don't necessarily We're all learning. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily know all the answers here. We're just trying sure. to figure this out. Um, <clears throat> so the firm that we've been working with around uh, our carbon footprint, and actually we're transitioning to MPS now has their own carbon footprint that's really uh, specific to the horticulture industry. So we'll be transitioning to theirs. But the firm that we've worked with, which is Carbon Footprint Limited out of the UK, <clears throat> in our initial phase, we just did scope one. And in the second phase, they said, you should choose either for scope two, inputs or outputs. Mm -hmm. The idea is sort of being somewhere along the chain, everybody's accountable for something. So if you're a manufacturer, and effectively we're growing something and there's inputs into that and outputs, so we're effectively a manufacturer in that sense. You're bringing in products and you're shipping out products. So you should be looking to account for the transportation of stuff in or out. And we said, it's a lot easier for us to track and take what's in. So we're looking at our emissions of all product coming in containers from Asia with our ceramics, um, truckloads of cardboard coming from the factories in Southern California that the, the boxes for the orchids. Mm -hmm. uh, the plants, the little mini plants, we fly, we do fly those in by air freight from Europe. And so we account for all of that in our scope too. Um, and we've done that now for two years in a row and it is significant. Um, scope three, well, let me talk about what we're doing about scope two. So scope two, uh, we do see the, the, the impact of that, of the, of the inputs that we've got here. Uh, so the in, on the input end, uh, we, absolutely work on and that's really honestly an, an economical thing for us containers are very expensive to bring into this country um it's coming back down to earth but for the last year year and a half it's been absolutely insane what what uh, container prices did out of asia um yeah. but we work on that but we're working right now for example there is one of the companies that designs and manufactures the ceramic pots that we sell our orchids in you can uh, your your listeners can't but you can see behind me on my shelf several ceramic uh, orchids and ceramic pots. Uh, those mostly come from China. At this time, one of our, uh, it's, a, it's a Canadian firm that does the design and contracting for those things, uh, but they've actually set up a factory in Tennessee that is now owned in the last half year up and fully running. Mm -hmm. And so we will be getting somewhere on the order of 25 to 30% of our ceramics manufactured domestically. I think that's a great story for a lot of reasons. I think what matters to your listeners mostly is that truck coming from Tennessee versus that container ship coming from Asia, overland transport in Asia on the container, then overland transport once it gets to the United States is a different impact. Um, and of course, the regulatory environment and the requirements in the United States versus what might be acceptable in Asia. You know, we, we you don't, there's only, as a small company, there's not a whole lot we can do to see what our partners abroad are doing, what their practices are. I do know that, it, you know, for example, we do have a, a standing rule here that there are certain uh, uh, things that we won't buy or ceramics that we won't buy. We won't buy anything that's got chrome in it, anything that's got sort of a metallic look to the paint. We know that the manufacturing process of that, you can do it in a really clean way. But you can't assume that it's done that. But I, I, we don't assume that it is. So, so, so we just generally work with ceramics that have been painted with more matte finishes and, and just uh, uh, things that e even if someone is, isn't being uh, environmentally conscious about it, it should be pretty clean. Uh, another aspect is, believe it or not, uh, we grow our plant, plants in, in, in bark. People see orc, they're grown in bark. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of trees in the United States. It's a big lumber industry in the United States, but the bark generally comes from abroad. And that's because there's no companies domestic. Yeah. There's no companies domestically that are doing a good job, um, sorting through and filtering and creating a bark that's clean enough to grow orchids in. Most of the bark that is created is used, just uses ground mulch in sure. the United States. Sure. So we are actively working with, uh, we're not the only large orchid grower in the country, but we're actively working with a couple of, uh, of our partners in the same business uh, to try to develop sources domestically for that. Uh, there was one a few years ago that we tried and, and, and failed, but we're gonna try again um, to find better domestic sources for this, for this stuff. 
So, now, so sort of onshoring is, 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 is part of that scope too, to try to reduce scope too. Um, and, and that's partly driven by a combination of economic factors and environmental aspiration, it sounds like. It's not simply yes. that you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's always hand in hand. Uh, on, on, the, on the other side of that, scope two out, I think you uh, alluded to in, you know, in our sort of emails back and forth, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's local production, but there's also, I think, something that's really important and maybe is not as sexy or as, 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 as nice to think about, but there's efficiencies of scale. So uh, we're a large grower. We grow 4 million orchids a year. When we ship to one of our customers, we are not putting a couple of trays of orchids in a van. Mm -hmm. Typically, we're filling a 53-foot trailer with 5,000, 6,000 orchids. And that's, so we're shipping it maybe a thousand miles to Seattle, or we're shipping it uh, uh, 300 something, 400 miles to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our, our footprint of distribution tends to be the Western third of the country. Uh, but the amount of carbon for one plant when you're shipping that many that efficiently is very low. So we're, we're, we're trying to great, really get good efficiencies in, in the scale of stuff. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we don't participate in, and that is really part of, for, for me personally, absolutely an environmental issue. We do not pursue single shipping online. We do have an online site, but the right. online site is very much focused towards uh, shipping single, like an entire box. So you're getting anywhere from six to 15 orchids at a time. And that's with a service that only does ground transportation. That's better for the plant. Plants boxes are gonna get tossed around. Right. But it's also a much better environmental aspect. The like the single shipper, we're you know we're kind of going two directions here as consumers, right? We're we're more conscious about environment, but we want the convenience of being able to order something on Amazon and have it the next yeah. day. That's not super environmentally friendly. There's a ton of packaging involved, and there's a lot of uh, of freight uh, involved for just a single thing. So it's something that you know. If you absolutely must have a single orchid, you can kind of look through a couple of pages and you'll find it. But it's some, it's not what we push. We want to, oh, so, so our, our business is built around large distribution as efficiently as possible. So if somebody wanted to purchase a Westerly orchid today, how would, what's the best way to do it for the environment? I think the best way to do it for the environment is to go to, as part of your regular grocery that you're mm -hmm. already doing, if you're going to Trader Joe's, uh, Mitch, I don't even know what, what, where are you? I mean, your customers Here's all Seattle. over the country. Here's Seattle. Oh, okay, great. So, you know, you might go to um, QFC mm -hmm. or you might go to Albertsons or Trader Joe's. Those are all customers of ours. And Safeway. So, you know, uh, and, yeah. Oh, it's Safeway up there. Um, yeah. So you go to one of those stores and you will be able to find a West LA Orchid in one of those stores. That's the most you're already going to do your regular grocery shopping. There's no it, there's no marginal extra impact from you as a consumer mm -hmm. to get those. That's, I think, the most environmentally practical way to get the product. Effectively combining your shopping trips into one, instead of going to buy an orchid, you buy an orchid while you're buying something else. That makes yes. sense. And, yeah. and also it reflects how our economy is very complex and allows you to do those kinds of things in a variety of ways, whether you go to the store or online. Uh, Tuan, I want to thank you for taking time to talk with us today. It's been fascinating. How can um, how can folks keep up with what you're doing? Uh, how can folks, uh, you know, again, like our website that needs to be rebuilt, um, we are actively working on building content around this story. Uh, in fact, just in the last week, um, your, your your listeners may notice I'm talking about a lot of stuff that's happened in the last year or the last week or even, uh, even yesterday. Um, but we are actively always trying to improve, but uh, we are active. We just cut a bunch of uh, footage about our environmental practices and more generally how we grow orchids. Uh, and we'll, we'll be editing that in the next couple of weeks. And then that will start coming out on our Instagram feed. So people okay. can find us on Instagram. Uh, our, our, our website is westerlay.com. Um, that will be getting updated um, it's just a very simple Shopify site now, but that is going to be getting updated with uh, a lot more content in the next couple of months. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the best way to keep up with us. You know, we'd love to, uh, 
anyone who, who who hears the program who has a question for us, uh, you know, shoot us something on our Instagram, and we'll we'll do our best to answer your questions. Well, Twan, thanks for taking time to talk with us today. We appreciate it. Mitch, thanks for what you're doing. Appreciate it. We've been talking with Twan Overgag. He is the president of Westerlay Orchids, and you can find out more about them at Westerlay. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-L-A-Y, westerlay.com. You know, we heard a variety of things in this conversation. One is that the economics of producing live plants is changing. Uh, it's it's being onshored and more uh, material is going to be produced here in the United States in order to reduce the shipping time in distance, which has environmental benefits. And on, and on the other hand, the whole industry is looking to reduce its footprint because it also reduces their costs, their water costs, their energy costs, and so forth. So all the surface area on buildings, on the greenhouses, and so forth could potentially become the energy source driving the business. So a lot of interesting things to follow up on. Other thing is, if you want to learn about how plants can be grown very efficiently, look for MPS, the uh, the Dutch uh, grower association that uh, Tuan mentioned. You'll learn a lot about uh, what uh, can be done. You know, we, while we were doing the research for this show, we talked about the fact that they're sourcing not only those pots from Asia, but uh, plants from the Netherlands. And uh, by looking for new domestic sources of flowers and other materials, we can as an economy, start to lower our overall footprint. But we have to recognize our interconnectivity with the rest of the world. It's going to be an interesting challenge to negotiate. This is Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I hope you'll take a few minutes to share this podcast and all the others that we've done. There's about 340, 45 of them out there now. Uh, with your friends, family, your, your coworkers, let's get everybody thinking about more ideas to create less waste. We'll be back soon with another Innovator interview. I'm Mitch Rackliff, your host. I've enjoyed spending the time with you today. So folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a great day.